Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to those of you all in different parts of the world. And welcome to you all today. We're delighted to have you joining us uh, for today's event. It's both a celebration and it's a call to action. Um, as you probably all know, it's a celebration of 20 years of the groundbreaking Security Council Resolution 1325, which recognized the rights and the roles of women in making and sustaining peace and security. But it's also an opportunity to look forward and how we can shore, shore up the women, peace and security agenda, protect the progress that it has enabled and give it new impetus for implementation. This is all the more relevant in our current environment of a global pandemic, which as we're seeing risks exacerbating existing gender roles and inequalities. So how can we drive that new impetus for implementation? Well, that brings us to the topic of our discussion today, which is, as we're calling it, connecting the dots between the women, peace, security agenda and arms control. Now, on the face of it, you'd expect that an agenda focused on armed conflict and women's experience and engagement in it would have a lot to say about arms control and about weapons. But the WPS agenda has been relatively slow to engage with multilateral disarmament and arms control. There's 11 Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security over two decades, but they contain relatively few references to arms and control and disarmament. And it's the same in the disarmament field too. Initiatives to improve women's participation and tackle the gendered impact of weapons have not tended to be framed explicitly in connection with women, peace and security or that agenda. So there's a disconnect there because weapons do shape how we wage war. The development, the transfer and the use of arms enable and drive the conflicts that in turn impact the experience of violence and devastation experienced by women around the world. So if we want to think about how we effectively reduce the impact of armed violence on women, then our argument is the regulation of weapons must be part of the women, peace and security agenda. So today's event in a month that we celebrate two decades of this agenda is a great opportunity to explore how we might integrate women, peace and security priority topics into arms control and disarmament processes and how those disarmament processes can contribute to the women, peace and security continued progress. And really, how can we build a multilateral system that moves away from its silos but is really mutually reinforcing and delivers for all, be it men, women, boys and girls. So this is a great opportunity for this discussion and we are absolutely delighted as Unidir to be doing this event together with eight partners and I think indicative of just how much energy and growing attention there is around this uh, connecting the dots agenda. We have with us UN Women, Australia, Canada, Ireland, Namibia, the Philippines, Sweden and the United Kingdom. And I think this really great group of countries that we've been working with shows us just how relevant, timely and inclusive this uh, this issue is. We've also got a fabulous panel um, that combines uh, really a diversity of practical experience and knowledge of conflict with how the perspectives and the role of women in tackling and navigating conflict and weapons therein uh, play. So I'm really honoured and absolutely delighted to, to introduce them. Uh, I'm not going to offer much of them because they all have very long CVs, but let me just say that um, I'm first to welcome Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland and current Chair of the Elders, uh, not in addition to being a, a personal kind of men, um, role model for so many of us in this field. She's also been a, a High Commissioner for Human Rights and as a lawyer in Ireland, champion to the rights of women. So Mary, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us here today. I'd also like to welcome Izumi Nakamitsu. Knows no introduction to many of you. She is our current UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs uh, and has been really a, a voice for uh, integrating gender perspectives in that capacity. But she brings with her to this question decades of, con of work uh, on and in conflict, whether as a humanitarian, as a peacekeeper, and as a development uh, actor. So welcome, Izumi. I'm uh, delighted then that we're 
a gender balance panel, and we have with us Lansana Gaberi, uh, known to many of our Geneva colleagues here as the ambassador of Sierra Leone to the UN in Geneva. But he's also, as you know, many of you will know, the incoming president of next year's Armed Trade Treaty Conference of States Parties. And Lansana brings with him a really extensive research and journalist background and career writing on war and in particularly in his home country of Sierra Leone. And then last but certainly not least, Anthony Kidi. Uh, Anthony is a psychologist who works in the practice of thinking about gender issues every day in, in conflict zones as technical advisor on masculinities, working with the Abad Resource Center for Gender Equality in, in Lebanon. So it really is a fabulous panel uh, and one that we hope will help us launch an interactive discussion. So we'll be really encouraging you to, to join us, to interact, to ask questions, to make comments. And then we'll wrap up in closing remarks. Uh, great honor to have on such a busy month, uh, we know, for UN Women, the UN Women Deputy Executive Director, Osa Regna. So welcome, Osa. So two formalities before we get down to the uh, interesting issues. Uh, first, uh, please, you can send your questions using the Q&A function at any time throughout the meeting or add your comments or thoughts. Uh, don't wait just to the end. And then perhaps also just to note that we're going to be recording this session so it's available for subsequent use. So just to, to note for you all. So Mary, I'm going to, to turn the floor to you um, first. Um, you know the WPS agenda and you know just how much it has done over the last uh, two decades, both to raise awareness about the specific needs of women and girls caught up in conflict, but also to articulate the value and the role that women can play in peace negotiations, in humanitarian response and UN peacekeeping. But it's, it's coming late to the party on arms control. And as yet, we don't really have in the Women, Peace and Security agenda a systematic approach to talking about and dealing with weapons. Can you help us think through what explains that disconnect? Mary, I'll just ask you to turn off here. Yeah. yeah, there we are. Good. <laughs> um, I'll try. Um, but first of all, may I just say as Chair of the Elders, how happy I am to connect the dots with you in this event because the elders are very concerned about gender equality, very concerned about issues of nuclear disarmament, so, and disarmament generally. So, um, and I took part in the last few days in two events for uh, Security Council Resolution 1325. The first was organized by Northern Ireland, by Northern Ireland's European Network and the Northern Ireland Assembly. I met many of the women from Northern Ireland whom I had worked with as president of Ireland. We had a, a love-in exchange, but we didn't talk about armaments. And then I had an event with UN Women, the Irish Mission and other missions in New York. Very good event, very well supported, et cetera. But we didn't talk about disarmament. So you can tell that I'm quite pleased to be here with you uh, today. And it has struck me that, uh, you know, UN Council Resolution 1325, which is used, which is fundamentally a resolution about armed conflicts, doesn't address the weapons used to wage those conflicts. Apart from a brief reference to the need for gender sensitive mine action and a reference to disarmament, demobilization and reintegration DDR programs, um, 1325 is silent on the relevance of gender issues to arms control and disarmament and doesn't address the impacts of rights and roles of women in regulating arms. So it is encouraging that some states, and I have to say, including my own country, Ireland, are increasingly exploring opportunities to break down the silos between the WPS and disarmament agendas within the multilateral system. Um, in fact, some notable successes, which have already been, I think, re re referenced, such as the adoption of the Arms Trade Treaty in 2013, which the ambassador will take the chair of, with its GBV provisions and the incorporation of gender sensitive provisions in the landmine and cluster munitions conventions, these are positive indicators. Um, I believe that the role of women in disarmament is still not a mainstream part of the women, peace and security agenda. And I hope we can help that today. And I believe one reason for this disconnect is the so-called specialist and traditionally male dominated nature of arms control. Um, I know that you, you know some excellent research conducted by Unidir 
highlights that when uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 was adopted, women comprised only about 15 to 20 percent of the diplomats participating in arms control conferences and negotiations. So basically, for a number of years, women were in effect broadly excluded from arms control and disarmament spaces at the decision making policy and negotiating level. And sadly, I don't think that situation is, is much better today. Arms control and disarmament is still well behind other areas of diplomacy in terms of women's representation. Gender stereotypes, which continue to endure, also play a role in keeping disarmament insulated from the WPS agenda. And arms control is still too often viewed as a hard policy area, uh, and that tends to exclude women. Uh, this is unfortunately also the case for new and emerging issues and new technologies, such as cyber weapons, artificial intelligence, and lethal autonomous weapons. These are areas women have to get in on. And so it's encouraging that a serious conversation is now underway on how to increase women's participation in disarmament of all levels. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thanks for reminding us just of where we're coming from, that it is a journey, as you point out. But we, ha we do have some lessons from the efforts to implement the WPS agenda for, to advance women's roles and engagement in uh, addressing armed conflict. Uh, do you think there's any lessons there that could be useful for the arms control community as it tries to advance a gender perspective? I think the main lesson is that women have to be at the table and have to be at the table in enough numbers and have to take leadership positions on you know, committees and on high level task forces and on, you know, they, they have to be, their voice has to be heard because there is a perspective that can be brought to the table. Uh, I think there's, a, there's a, a sense of a real empathy um, of women diplomats um, with the women, peace and security agenda. So it would be very helpful if there were more in the disarmament agenda so that as you say, and as we are going to talk about, we can connect those dots. Thank you so much, Mary. And I think that's, that's a word we'll come back to, empathy and perspective uh, over the course of the discussion. But Azumi, maybe turning to you now, there have been advances. We're starting off with a more positive, I think, and I hope spirit. Uh, and you've been behind some of them. You've spearheaded the Secretary General's efforts to have gender parity in the bodies he appoints or he has the, uh, the authority to establish. And as Mary said, we've seen progress in the Arms Trade Treaty and we've seen progress in the Oslo Action Plan of the Mind Ban Convention, which is integrating gender perspectives in there. So how, how do you think about these trends? Uh, what's worked and where do we need to still make some advances? Thank you. Thank you, Renata, for this uh, meeting. And uh, it's very difficult to actually come after Mary, as usual, but, uh, <laughs> but I would try. <laughs> no, it is true. <laughs> um, so uh, as, as you say, I think we are on the right trajectory. We have been making progress. Uh, but I think, as we all agreed, um, there are still a lot of more things to do. Um, and I, for me, um, there are, let me just mention um, three or four things. Um, one is that one of the reasons why um, it's not so connected, uh, it has not been so connected so far, is also because, as Mary also indicated, the settlement community has not been so connected in the broader peace and security and I would also add a uh, development cooperation and sustainable development SDG communities. Um, if you remember, Renata, one of the main objectives of Secretary General's agenda for disarmament, therefore, has been to make that linkage, strategic linkage, uh, of how arms control and disarmament actually greatly contribute to uh, other priority agenda of the United Nations. So it's not just the women, peace and security, uh, but disarmament overall has to be seen to be a core part of UN's mandate uh, and uh, vice versa. Uh, we need to have that uh, strategic linkages uh, very strongly made. The second is that um, um, what we are uh, discussing really is a need for cross-cutting collaboration um, and um, and I think, um, you know, we have been making some progress, actually important progress on analyzing and better understanding the gendered impact of different weapon systems 
in the nuclear weapons field, you know, a lot of NGO humanitarian community has actually uh, really identified how, the, how these particular uh, weapon systems impact women and men differently. Uh, we are now uh, in the middle of this uh, um, uh, main, gender mainstreaming uh, in arms policies, you know, small arms policies and program, programs, both in terms of understanding that uh, impact, uh, but also in terms of uh, really integrating at the core uh, programmatic interventions. Uh, and, and this we think is a, a very important uh, aspect of our work. And then, you know, um, we are now also launching connection between ammunition and gender. So all these work of making linkages um, uh, between different weapon systems and gender perspectives really need to uh, push, you know, uh, further. Uh, um, and then uh, I think the, 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 the third, uh, as Mary pointed out, parity matters. Um, we have been taking statistics um, of uh, how uh, member states' delegations have been uh, represented and then who have been making statements. For example, last you know, we're in the middle of the first committee at the moment for this year. The last year's uh, statistics show that when diplomats met um, during the first committee, three of every four statements came from men. Um, so in terms of parity um, and meaningful participation of women who are negotiating these issues uh, in the multilateral settings, we still have a, a long way to go. And again, um, you know, there isn't just one thing that we have to do, but there are a variety of uh, actions that we have to take. Uh, including, uh, um, you know, increased number of training uh, opportunities, uh, empowerment of people, uh, and also, as Renata pointed out, wherever we can make the decisions on compositions of various bodies, like the group of the uh, governmental experts, etc., the, the advisory board, uh, we are pushing. The Secretary General is really uh, aggressively pushing the parity. Parity means 50-50. And I think these things actually contribute to uh, really uh, breaking down the systemic and structural barriers. Um, and that's where we actually have to get to. As the Secretary General always repeats, um, this is, uh, you know, inequality is a question of power. Uh, so we have to break that power imbalance uh, and, uh, and, and pushing the, the parity agenda uh, will be a, a useful and very forceful means to break that uh, power uh, structures that is uh, persistent. Um, and as, uh, as we go into more and more of those new technology areas where girls are um, you know, much less uh, represented, um, we will be, um, you know, unless we start doing something about it, we will be replicating, repeating the gender imbalance in the new areas of arms control and disarmament discussions. So we have to make sure that would not happen. So, you know, that's why we're reaching out to really young generations, you know, you know, ages in the middle school, high school. Uh, we have to, you know, uh, do that sort of educational and empowering uh, type of activities as well. And my final point is I think we have to also be mindful of um, other uh, inequalities. Um, gender, yes, of course, uh, but I think it is also linked to uh, age, ethnicity, disabilities. Uh, we have to make sure that all of those inequality issues will be addressed. Um, uh, be, simply because also I think that will help uh, the gender, uh, addressing the gender inequality issues as well. Uh, so um, um, connecting the dots, I think, is the right word. Um, it's it's the, 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 you know, bringing uh, the, the holistic perspectives and, and, and making linkages between those various areas of underrepresentation um, and, and inequalities we will be hopefully able to make the, the final push and, 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 and be able to achieve um, equalities um, in, and parity in those discussions. But thank you very much for this meeting. Exciting. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Izumi. And I think you, you point out something, both you and Mary, which is that there's aspects of the culture of multilateral diplomacy that perhaps need to change towards inclusivity and diversity. But then there's specific aspects of the disarmament, uh, specific issue of the business of weapons that has some perhaps dimensions to it. And I think it's interesting, it would be interesting to come back to this in the question and answer 
we might say some of that is the legacy of the past, military experiences, other fields, but it's interesting that it's also happening in the newer fields of cyber issues, lethal autonomous weapon systems, and some of the areas that perhaps don't have the baggage of the old uh, in that. And maybe I'll just ask the other question, maybe flip it a little bit, Izumi, just to you. Uh, you know, we see some of these trends in, in the gender responsive arms control, and you mentioned them, and, and the things that are within your capacity to shape in the system as well as amongst member states. But how can these be brought back to the women, peace, and security discussions? Is there scope for a two way discussion between the women, peace, security agenda and actors? and the arms control disarmament actors? No, thank you. Um, I think one thing that we really need to understand and, and advocate uh, very widely is the fact that arms control and, and disarmament intersects with all of the four areas of WPS agenda, uh, participation, protection, very important aspects of um, uh, disarmament, prevention, obviously, and relief and recovery. Um, so we need to actually look at the core uh, root of those uh, substantive areas where we really see uh, very important linkages uh, between the disarmament and WPS agenda. So um, we are, you know, very, very, very keen uh, to, um, you know, making sure that our experts uh, on those uh, gender equality issues, WPS uh, related issues and uh, disarmament experts um, are having a wider conversations of how these things can actually reinforce each other. Um, and, um, and I think, um, you know, that has to be fed into um, variety, you know, different levels of our activities. One is, of course, uh, norm making negotiations for policy frameworks, all the way down to the, the ground level. Uh, implementation of uh, uh, new uh, norms and, and I'm beginning to see um, you know some um, um, progress being made uh, you know uh, if, if we could actually have um, you know uh, our gender uh, focal points expert people in those respective communities um, you know uh, moving um, the substantive areas uh, you know between disarmament to development, WPS, peacekeeping, et cetera, peace building, uh, I think we will be able to uh, make a, a more natural um, um, linkages uh, through uh, regular sort of uh, people um, into, um, you know, um, exchanges. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, again, uh, here, it's not just one thing that we should be doing, it's a, a combination of variety of actions that we uh, we need to we need to uh, take in order for us to be able to design gender responsive um, um, indicators and, and, and uh, interventions thank so, you um, yeah i'm going to i'm going to interrupt you there Izumi, only so that i can uh, move on to 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 lansana um, and and bring him into the conversation lansana uh, you're you're now both a practicing diplomat and going to soon be the chair of the arms trade treaty conference and the state parties. And one thing that Izumi mentioned, the efforts to, to represent more women in these sorts of forums. One thing that we noticed at Unidir when we did uh, research on the role of women in these processes is that we found that diplomats generally agreed with the idea of equal opportunities for men and women. When we had these focus groups, there was a lot of uh, agreement on that. But when we asked them about we should have gender equality and gender analysis in arms control and disarmament, they backed off some of them on that. They felt that, yes, I'm up for the principle, but I don't think special measures should be, should be initiated. So, I mean, from that perspective that obviously it shows there's a range of perspectives, what do you think, how should the principle of gender equality and, and the tools of gender analysis be incorporated into arms control discussions, as Izumi mentioned? What, what are your thoughts on how that could happen? <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Renata. And first of all, let me say how deeply honored I am to share a, a forum with um, Ms. Mary Robinson. I remember when I was a journalist, what was going on in Sierra Leone, her voice was very critical in highlighting uh, gender and human rights issues, and that has really stuck with me. Before then, 
uh, talk of ending the world didn't really uh, stress very much human rights issues, especially as they affected women and children, but her voice was absolutely crucial in her life. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. Um, so I, I speak then as someone who observed the role of women in the war, in ending the war in Sierra Leone and in the disarmament process because they were absolutely critical. The um, Women's Movement for Peace, uh, which was a critical book in ending the war, as well as um, in uh, returning Sierra Leone to multi-party democracy, which we now enjoy. Uh, and also as uh, the current president of the ATT, uh, which is one of the arms trade treaties, with the only one I think, in my judgment, which has actually highlighted and privileged uh, gender issues as an important component of um, disarmament and arms trade. Uh, to your specific question, I think, um, you know, within the arms trade treaty, there are so many uh, interests uh, and extremely powerful interests as well. Uh, so one way of approaching this, and we talk all the time, uh, our presidency for this uh, conference emphasizes a lot on gender issues, in, which is why in fact, it was part of the reasons why we decided to choose as our theme, uh, small arms and light weapons, because uh, in my own past history, studying the war in, in West Africa and other places, uh, women are most vulnerable to these uh, kinds of weapons um, in, in those kinds of war situations. Uh, so it is the reason why we decided to highlight it as, as, uh, as our main theme uh, throughout this presidency. And gender is um, the cornerstone of that particular theme. Um, we talk all the time about gender equality. Uh, I think uh, in terms of what you're asking, I think the most important component is just to have more women diplomats uh, representing particularly some of the more powerful countries uh, controlling the arms trade. Uh, if we have them, the conversation will be much different and actions will be much different. That I know from experience um, because women just bring greater empathy, greater uh, concerns about human rights and greater uh, forcefulness around these issues than men do. Uh, and I have noticed that as a diplomat, I noticed that as a journalist, as a researcher, this is just clear, we just need to have more women, especially for more, some of the more powerful countries, as diplomats um, in these conferences on these high tables. Otherwise, uh, the discussion can get lost in in arcane details and, and nothing really gets done. Uh, it can enter resolutions and statements and, and all that, but you, you don't really take very strong actions. But when we have more women, their forcefulness and the passion they bring to this topic uh, can move people and can, can change things. But we don't have as many women. I mean, I have uh, chaired a few meetings and there are a number of strong women diplomats and they, they speak out forcefully, but some of the voices can get drowned by other uh, entrenched interests. And I think it is important to, to, to just get more women up on the high table. And that I think is, is frankly, the, probably the only way to make sure that real action is taken. Uh, you can do resolutions and make statements and, and, uh, and talk and talk, but until you get people who can push it through to real action, there will be last minute interventions from powerful interests that then will make the whole thing, the gender issues, um, a footnote to larger themes, larger interests. And that I think uh, we just need to change that. So you echo a little bit, I think, both Mary and Azumi, that it's a wider cultural issue. It's a numbers issue, it's a participation issue, but it's a conversation and cultural change. I'm going to, to already direct a question that has come from one of our commenters, um, Lansana, very much, I think, to you, which is, as you pointed out, there is something different about the Arms Trade Treaty. It has provisions on gender-based violence that was considered a breakthrough, and that was the effect of, I think, a lot of civil society actors and amongst the many women. But, but the question is that comes from, from the floor, Liat uh, Biron, is that the, they're rather vague. 
these provisions? And are there, are there plans or processes in place to make these more specific? And, and would that be feasible to, to do that? Yeah, there are plans to, yes, they are somewhat vague and somewhat um, generic. And, and, and we, it needs to be firm up to, um, to lead to actual concrete action. Uh, and we have started conversations with a broad range of actors and civil society, as you said, has been extremely uh, focal on these issues. I've spoken to quite a few of them, say for war control arms, and a number of them, and they have very specific um, suggestions that you've been pushing. Um, of course, things are very difficult in the COVID era. You don't get people around together and, and uh, you, you do Zoom and, and, and then um, people don't get to meet and, and really plan very well. So that's one big issue. But I, I, I hope in our presidency we'll be able to, to put these issues uh, so that uh, some of these actions can be concretized, which is why, as I said, I mean, it's, uh, it's clearly uh, the, the theme that we suggested is very highly resonant in terms of gender issues, the theme of small arms and light weapons, and, uh, and which, which is central to disarmament issues in many, many parts of the world. And so we, we will, we have already um, done the resolution on that and, and gender was um, a very big part of that resolution, it was highlighted. But again, that's res a resolution. Um, it, it can be replaced with strong. We need real concrete action and, and this is what we aim to do uh, going forward. I, currently we are in consultations and we may be able to, to get something more concrete uh, going forward. And I hope we will be able to do so. Mm -hmm. No, oh, thanks. Thanks but very I, much. I am a, a gender champion I, within the Geneva, Geneva diplomatic community. I, I was um, so nice to come in. I was uh, adopted as one of the gender champions. So uh, I'm very much committed to that. Thank you. And I think we have a lot of uh, gender champions here from the International Gender Champions Group, both uh, in Geneva, in New York. I hope there's some people from Vienna and The Hague here. So I think very much that this group has been really important, in particular the working group that the Gender and Disarmament Impact Group that Ireland, Namibia, Canada and the Philippines are spearheading together with Unity are here. So I think it's exactly a good example of the leadership that can follow. Anthony, you've been patiently listening to, to all of this. And unlike many of us, you're not just talking the talk, you're walking the walk, as they say. You're operating in, in the Middle East. You're in a zone and in a region of conflict. And you're working from a perspective of uh, looking on issues of gender violence in conflict-affected regions. The, the women, peace and security agenda is relatively quiet on men and masculinities. Uh, and, and to be frank, conversations on arms control and disarmament have also been relatively uh, silent on, on the question of the links between weapons, uh, between men and masculinities. Uh, from your perspective in the Middle East, what actions can have the biggest impact in terms of transforming violent masculinities? And to what extent do we need to have a more explicit and concrete conversation about masculinity? Hey, thank you so much, uh, Renata. And thank you. Uh, I can't tell you how humbled and, and honored I am to be part of this illustrious group of people. It's, it's thank you. It, it means quite a bit to, to be part of this. So like, like seemingly all things, uh, the best approach is actually uh, borrowed and, and learned from the, the feminist movement, and that is that the personal is political. And it's about creating a, a space where men within their communities, uh, individually, uh, within training scenarios, of which we, we have come up and, and many people have come up with uh, great systematized approaches on, on how to do that, to really have men reflect on, on their gender socialization and to see how the same way we, we socialize women to be sub subversive and silent and to deny the power, the inherent power that they have in their agency, we, we socialize and psychologically condition men to see their sense of agency through violence. We, we, we weaponize uh, um, men through a patriarchal framework. Um, looking, uh, again, coming from very personal places, the toys that we played with growing up are guns, bombs, knives. Before I could write my own name, uh, I, I already know how to handle a gun because those were all the toys I played with. All of the heroes we, we grow up hearing about, whether they be fictional 
or, or historical are, have, have been people who have had a particular perspective of what was right or wrong, but have uh, attained uh, the, the success or have, have worked towards that goal through violence. And, and so we're, we're unindated with these messages of violence is acceptable and necessary in order to fight for good, to fight for peace, that, that fighting is, is almost a, a necessary condition for, for attaining uh, those, those goals. And, and uh, as a result of that, we, we have them reflect on how negatively that has impacted their lives, how men are not conditioned towards empathy the same way women are. And, and all of that is serving a greater purpose. It's hard to empathize during war. You cannot think about the human being who meets the other side of a bullet or a bomb. And so empathy is actually counterproductive towards war and militarism. And, and that's why it's essential uh, towards patriarchal uh, socialization processes. So it's really about having men reflect on that on a personal level. And then, you know, through that ecological, holistic perspective, have them slowly see how it affects themselves personally, females and, and children and people around them in their direct families, in their communities, in their nations, and through international geopolitics, where, where there's still a lot of profitability from war and weapons development, uh, built on the blood and bones and bodies of the people that they leave in their wake. And the culprits of that are men who, who are brainwashed to believe that there's even glory in death, almost uh, such as the historical military, militarized societies of Sparta, there's almost still uh, very much a connotation of the greatest honor one can have is to die in service of one's family, nation, religion, et cetera, fill in blank here. Because, because when we socialize young men like that from a very young age, there's very little resistance towards those things in the future. And when all of a sudden there is a quote unquote, call to arms. These are very typical terms that, that we feel men see it as an honor and an obligation to kill and to die uh, for all of these things. And it's all part of, of a greater discourse that, that serves um, uh, people at the top and who come at the expense of men and especially women and children. And so through these processes, we can see men uh, uh, change and start to understand that there there is not one way to be a man and it's not only one patriarchal definition of masculinity but several and and hopefully we can move more towards equitable uh, understandings of of what it means to be a man or if one wants chooses to to need to have a masculine identity at, at the end of the day gender is, is quite performative that that you can very much be a man who believes in peace and who supports um women's uh, leadership in this in this arena because probably their exclusion has been the greatest factor towards why these these things have have failed to change over the centuries mm. oh, indeed and you you flag on the points of war and if we just think about some of the conflicts that we currently see unfolding yemen or even nagorno karabakh right now many of the sort of attitudes and cultural perspectives that you reflect uh, are, are very dominant there um you know, you're in a meeting today, Anthony, on, on women, peace and security. And, and one thing that I think we often find is when you come to an agenda item in a meeting on women, the room is three quarters full of women. It's one of the few arms control discussions where you see the roles, the numbers reversed. So how to, what are some productive ways? How can we think about finding productive ways to engage men in the agenda on women and peace security? Uh, including around initiatives to prevent gender-based violence, and and what's your been your experience of how to bring men into that agenda? Right. So um, obviously, the, the, it is a bit of a longer process uh, in the field of masculinity. So we often speak about transformative change, and when we start having the the discourse and the dialogue that I previously mentioned, we can slowly work towards understanding militarized masculinities and and how how even when, when we look at militarized discourses, uh, we have kept the nation uh, symbolized as, as a feminine because this, this is all, again, it ties very nicely into the protector role that most men are raised with and that, those obligations to, to fight and to protect. And so with time, we can, we can allow men, especially in a conflict, uh, afflicted society where where they can reflect on many losses that they've had. We can uh, 
allow men to understand it is very important for them to not only understand that there is another way uh, to look at masculinities and femininities and equality, but to lend their voices to the feminist movements and women's organizations who have been calling for change, that this is not a new dialogue. It's just like most dialogues that have been led by women, it, it stays under the surface, it stays submersive, it doesn't get the attention that it needs. And what is what can help uh, very much so is men lending their voices and support to initiatives to end gender-based violence, to talk about the, the impact and the effects of war, conflict, militarism, and violence in general, uh, on women and to go beyond that and to become allies and support women's political leadership, women's uh, leadership when it comes to peace negotiations and, and peace building. Um, and to really understand that the patriarchal model and the way masculinity is understood from a militarized perspective is one that theoretically is built on power over. I am only secure if I'm stronger than the person in front of me. And, and they really utilize that fear uh, in, in terms of annually increasing defense budgets, uh, arms budgets, needs for new methods of using technology to weaponize uh, uh, different things. And that really what a feminist uh, peace theory comes from is power with. How can we see how our needs and the needs of the, the people who are now looked at as opposition can be met through negotiations, through, through tolerance, through seeing what, what is the best way that we all become stronger together. What, how, what are the plethora of options that are available solutions beyond just, just using war and weapons and violence in order to, to silence the opposition and to get what we need. And at, at the end of the day, um, it, it really is necessary for men to see that, that, that we reap what we sow. And if we think about bombs and bullets as seeds of, of patriarchy, we can only understand that if we continue on that trajectory, the only logical outcome is more war, more conflict, and more violence. And it doesn't stop there. New societies are built where uh, a discourse of revenge is given to the new group of men and to the new society to continue on, on that trajectory. Whereas voices of feminist peace and feminist voices about peace are offering different solutions that actually have of a trajectory of, of peace building. And the sooner men understand that we lend our voices uh, to those, to those um, powerful leaders, that we can be part of the change instead of systematically weaponized by, by the powers that be to become cogs in their system of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that. And I think there are going to be some questions coming to you that very much reflect on this idea of, of the militarization of our security discourse, whether it's peace negotiations, whether it's protection. And you also, I think, illustrated a very interesting point, which is that security so often is perceived in a binary, uh, a, a zero sum game. My security is your insecurity. And how to sort of change that dynamic, which is at the heart of human security, which is at the collective security and is at the heart of gender, gender under uh, secure environments. Um, I, I see that we already have a lot of comments and questions, so I'm going to be uh, moving to the, to the chats, to the functions, those of you who wish to, to add your voice or if there's a question you like there, do echo it. But I want to just bring in a few of our, our, our colleagues working on this issue and who've been in, involved in this agenda today uh, to let them maybe offer, offer a question and a comment. And then I'm going to open up to uh, the panel for some thoughts and comments. But first, perhaps, uh, Ambassador Sally Mansfield uh, from here in Geneva, from Australia. Sally, do you want to uh, join uh, the conversation? Hi, Sally. Have you got your unmute button open? Just you can. Yeah, there you go. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Renata, and, and many thanks to the panelists. Um, it's a, a, a great discussion and that sense of looking at it from the big picture power um, uh, set of issues as well as the, um, the individual engagement. And I think um, you know, that, that sense that it's fundamentally um, about power structures. And if we're thinking about um, domestic violence um, and issues there around gender, if we're thinking about um, communities where small arms um, are really devastating 
and then we sort of think up to the, the sort of really big, you know, weapons of mass destruction. It, it's, it's a kind of a, a continu continuum in, in a sense. And perhaps what can also be useful is, is more um, of, a, of a clear narrative um, of really good examples of when having uh, women involved, when having a diversity of voices has led to really good tangible results. Because I do feel as though that um, issue around communicating why it matters um, it, it is something that all of us could, could perhaps do um, a little bit more. Just one anecdote, I mean, we were one of the presidents of the Conference on Disarmament this year. Um, our presidency was very much affected by COVID, but we still went ahead and had a lot of bilateral consultations. And we tried to do something that we thought would be fairly simple. And that was to change the CD rules of procedure and make them gender neutral. We thought the symbolism of that was important. Um, but we found even that ran up against a trust deficit. So I do feel as though this sort of effort around communicating and understanding why um, and that that empowerment at local community level, as well as from, um, from diplomats, as, um, as Ansana mentioned, um, we need to be seeing women um, really take the reins on these issues across the full range of these um, disarmament conversations. Many thanks to the panellists and uh, to Unidir for taking this forward. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Sally, and I think it's a, it's a concrete example that what appears to be a relatively small measure can often prove a, a very difficult measure, and, and, and I see Lansana and Izumi nodding there. You've both been in those conference rooms and, and see exactly that. I do want to get us beyond the participation question and, and to move on, but let me, just before doing, I'm going to bring in uh, Pendananda, Ambassador Pendananda from Namibia, and of course Namibia is such a role in the uh, 1325 that uh, you, you're very much at the father and a mother of it. Penda. Thank you, Madam Moderator, uh, Dr. Renata. Uh, let me stand by the protocol already established uh, and thank all the participants for their insightful uh, presentations. I think, uh, let me also uh, congratulate you, Nidia, and all the co-sponsors for organizing this informative discussion dedicated to the 20th uh, anniversary of uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 of 2000. Uh, Namibia is proud to be part of this uh, initiative. Uh, moderator, uh, women empowerment and gender mainstreaming is one of the main priorities of Namibia's domestic and foreign policy objectives. Uh, it is for this reason that Namibia continues to, to be a champion for what is now a landmark United Nations Security Council Resolution uh, 1325. Because we are of the firm view that by enhancing the gender perspective, we are changing the face of women in, in conflict and post-conflict and also recognizing and reaffirming the crucial role women play in, the, in these critical situations. Uh, as widely known, this uh, Security Council resolution was adopted during Namibia's presidency of the Security Council in uh, October 2000. And because of our commitment to the Women, Peace and Security agenda, Namibia became the first African nation to host a global focal point network's third annual meeting on Women, Peace and Security in April 2019 in Vintuk, under the theme Towards Full Participation with a sub-theme, mainstreaming the women, in peace, women peace and security agenda in economic communities. During this meeting, Namibia managed to introduce two new discussions within the women peace and security agenda, namely the role of youth in the women and peace security agenda, as well as the connection between disarmament and the women peace and security agenda. As such, Namibia demonstrated its uh, political will to create a gender equality and mainstreaming in the security sector and prevent, and prevent violence against women. In keeping the spirit of Resolution 1325, we have launched the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. The development of the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security enables direct and sustained attention to mainstreaming gender into peace 
and security sector track and collect gender disaggregated data for women in peace and security sector and to monitor and evaluate the implementation of the women peace and security agenda. We believe that a lot of work still needs to be done. This was proven in 2015 during the, uh, uh, the, the, the global study, which revealed that the implementation of the WSP agenda is still lagging, as many countries are still to adapt national action plans and implement them. Let me use this opportunity to announce that on the 31st of October, which is this coming Saturday, Namibia will launch the International Women Peace Center in Ventuk, which coincides with the 20th anniversary of the, of the Security Council Resolution uh, 1325. The objective of this center will be to focus on research aspects in mediation and negotiations, as well as capacity building of women peacekeepers in addressing gender and arms related gender based violence. This launch will be streamed on social media. In conclusion, Madam Moderator, let me applaud the Human Rights Council for adopting by consensus a resolution titled promoting and protecting human rights of women and girls in conflict and post-conflict situations on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which was submitted by Namibia, Spain, Australia, Azerbaijan, Tunisia, Iraq, and Argentina, which provides an avenue for, human rights council, for the Human Rights Council to mainstream in its work the human rights aspect of the Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. Also, Thank you very much, Penda. Uh, I'm going to just to ask you to wrap up because I want to make sure that we get a chance to speak to everyone. But just thank you so yes, much I, for I'm bringing I'm the human I'm rights. Wrapping, yeah, I'm wrapping up now. Uh, this resolution adds to another Human Rights Council Resolution 14 stroke 22 on the impact of, of arms transfer and human rights which with a particular focus on women, children, and, and the elderly persons with disabilities and the vulnerable groups that was referred to earlier by Ambassador Lansana Berry, the diversion of arms and unregulated and, or illicit arms transfer by states and non-state actors does not only undermine human rights, but diverts the much needed resources away from development. Therefore, la la lastly, I would like to reaffirm and reiterate Namibia's commitment to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and will continue to work with other stakeholders to promote the empowerment of women as a means of fostering peace and security. I thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm sorry. Thank but <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Panda, and congratulations on the establishment of your Women, Peace and Security Center. I think a question that I would like the panel to think about just before we move over to you, I've got one more intervention is, is a question that's come up from the floor is to what extent it's great to be having this emphasis on women, peace and security and bringing women into things like peacekeeping, women bringing into the armed forces. But is there a risk that we're militarizing women further rather than bringing women's demilitarizing uh, dimension and power in, are we, are we militarizing or securitizing the WPS agenda? So to give you a heads up, I'm gonna turn that question to you in just a second. But before I do, um, I'm going to give the floor to one of our uh, great partners in this enterprise on the women and gender, peace and security issues, Michael Gaffey, Ambassador of Ireland here in uh, Geneva. Michael, uh, welcome. And just, you might want to unmute, unmute Michael. Okay, have I unmuted? Excellent. Thank you, Renata, and I'll, I'll be as brief as, as possible, uh, and therefore I won't ask that, answer that last question that you asked. I'll start with a, a tiny anecdote. I was asked uh, only a month ago to be on a panel uh, talking about peace and security in multilateralism, and I said I couldn't because all five panelists were men. So they put me on the panel on women, peace and security, where all the other panelists were women. So there is still an issue there on participation, and we won't focus exclusively on it. And as Mary Robinson says, there are hard and soft issues and who is discussing which is still an issue. So thank you hugely to the panel for what is a really, really positive uh, discussion. As you mentioned, we working with you in Canada and Namibia have made a start on um, 
uh, Gender and Disarmament through the International Gender Champions Disarmament Group. And um, this involves work on representation, but also the multiple and complex gendered impacts of nuclear and conventional weapons. But as you've said, progress is slow and we have to repeat and repeat and repeat basic points in order to, to make progress. And the Women, Peace and Security Agenda really, I believe, has the potential to help us unlock progress on gender and disarmament and vice versa. So they are mutually reinforcing uh, agendas. The question is, why are we being so slow in implementing them in a mutually reinforcing way? It's partly because the Women, Peace and Security Agenda emerged through a Security Council resolution. But there is also, the more I, 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 time I spend here in Geneva, there is a wide range of detailed work and activity here which relates directly to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, and which is perhaps not being captured or, or, or feeding into the agenda as strongly as it could. Now, in addition to disarmament, it involves work on the thematic areas of human rights, humanitarian action, development, inclusive peace processes, and indeed the gendered impacts of, of climate change and their contribution to conflict and armed violence. So the big question for all of us really is how we can be more effective in taking a coherent, integrated and holistic approach to the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We haven't managed it yet. We need to do it in New York, in Geneva, and most importantly, on the ground. And um, I suspect the answer as to how we will do it, Izumi Nakamitsu will tell us, is for states to implement the UN Secretary General's disarmament agenda, which uh, links disarmament explicitly into the SDGs. And I think a rereading and, and refocus on that would actually help us make progress on the WPS agenda. But thank you again. Thanks for the discussion and thanks to the panelists. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. And indeed, the, the question of the integrating arms control into the uh, SDG agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. And I know that when we first held a meeting of that, someone came up to me and said, I think I'm in the wrong room. I thought I was in an arms control and disarmament discussion, and I see all these Sustainable Development Goals uh, signs up in the PowerPoint. So there is a long way to go, as you pointed out, but there is the scope to do so. Izumi, I'm going to turn to, to you first to kick off, and then I'll follow with the various panelists. But uh, on this question of coherence, you've talked about this being a, 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 a culture issue, you've talked about it being a people's issue, if the same people go to different meetings and if there's more of an engagement and that conversation being sustained. But I also want to, uh, to just uh, encourage you to reflect a little bit on this question that so many from the panel, so many joining us in Q&A are writing about, which is how, how do we uh, advance the WPS agenda? How do we advance gender and arms control without this becoming a militarizing uh, agenda? Over to you, Izumi. Thank you. It's an excellent question. And I have my own personal view, which is that if people perceive security um, to be maintained by military means, then I think it is an imbalance and an inaccurate understanding of security. Um, you know, certainly appropriate level of self-defense capabilities is one of the security means, but uh, a security has always been maintained by a web of or combination of various means, including arms control and disarmament agreements, and of course, you know, I mean, whether that is a Treaty of Westphalia or Versailles or San Francisco, you know, the multilateral agreements has been at the center of maintaining international peace and security. So let us not forget that. Um, and we need to uh, really counter this, this perception that it's the arms, it's the missiles, and, and, and it's the weapons that maintain our security. Uh, security is not such a, a monolithic, a, a simplistic uh, concept. And it has, uh, historically, it has never been that. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, um, we actually do have a, an important opportunity um, because of the COVID to really uh, further develop and expand um, um, the concept, wider concept of security that is, of course, human security at the core of it. Uh, but um, as I say, militarized uh, perception of security is inaccurate uh, historically. Um, so my answer to that is that, um, you know, women getting into those areas, I don't think 
is a, a reflection of militarizing uh, the whole agenda, quite the contrary. What we need to change is the concept of security itself. And uh, as I say, and, and you, you are probably tired of hearing this from me, disarmament is a very important tool. Thanks, Izumi. Mary, if I could turn to you, uh, you talked about the importance of participation and just how, and you used the experience from, from peace negotiations in Northern Ireland, from the arms control, from the diplomacy. But of course, as, as we all know, the, the women, peace and security has a few other components. There's a strong emphasis on protection, gender-based violence in particular. There's an emphasis on prevention and, the, and preventing violence against women. And then, of course, there's an, an, an element about the role of women in relief and recovery. How do we, how can we engage these other aspects of women, peace and security into the, the conversation on arms control and into our policies and processes on disarmament and not going beyond just the, the numbers game. And I'll ask you just to unmute Mary if I can. <laughs> we always have to get you know up to speed on technology. <laughs> um, it's a good question. Uh, by the way, this is a great discussion uh, and a timely discussion. And so, I'm in, from in a way, there is an expertise that has been built up on the women, peace, and security agenda. Uh, you know, I remember very well going back, like the ambassador of Namibia, to the history of it all. Um, uh, the 10th anniversary, I was chairing a civil society uh, panel with um, Binta Diop of Fam Africa Solidarity. We had hearings all around the, the world at the time. Uh, the, the panel consisted of only three men. I think were, we were 15 or something. Men were in a minority, but they were very good on the panel. And uh, you know, it, it was recognizing at that time, not enough was being done with plans of action, et cetera. Since then, there's been an acceleration of expertise on the WPS agenda. Um, the disaggregation of data, the uh, having uh, special advisors in the right places at the right time, all of these things that are not happening in disarmament. Uh, I welcomed the ambassador of Sierra Leone and others in Australia talking about the need for more women to be at the table. But actually, let's be very clear. This is not an easy issue, uh, disarmament, for somebody to just come in as an ambassador. You need to be very well equipped, well, you know, you know, immersed in the details of it in order to make a real impact. So that's what we talk about: real participation. It's a training, it's a, a an education, if you like, to the issues, and then it's a cross-referencing of those issues. And I loved Anthony's points about masculinity. We actually don't hear enough about that on the women, peace, and security agenda. We use it on both agendas, but you know, it's very, it's very true. So uh, what can I say, except I do feel there is a built up expertise on the women, peace and security agenda, largely from and through women, but with good men also, but it's there. It needs to transfer across. And I think Sumi was making this point as well. Um, and we need to bring it in, in a way to the audience about militarization. It, it's a very serious question. Um, the worst thing that could happen would be that we, <laughs> um, you know, kind of uh, have women's voices supporting. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think we would, if we can get the critical mass, if we can get the experience, if we can get the data desegreg you know, desegregation on small arms and light weapons, all of those things are relevant. Um, so it's a great discussion. I'm enjoying it. No, thanks, Mary. And I think your point about, uh, and it's one that Izumi has flagged too, and I think we'll come to when we come back to you, Lance, on it, is about 
what expertise can we bring to discussions that wasn't traditionally seen in disarmament expertise? And some of the civil society actors really bring in, for example, victims' perspectives, assistance yes, to victims, absolutely. being a really yeah. something fundamental in raising a whole bring other set of conversations. Anthony, I wanted to come to you uh, because uh, you, you really, I think, offer something that is more fundamental to our discussion that we often miss in, in the diplomatic world. And the question that has come from the floor is that it's also important to note that women are, can also be actors perpetuating gender inequality, that it's important to underscore it's not a, it's not a, it's not a quality pertaining to male. Um, and, and there's an, a need to break this cycle and, and how to look at women empowering other women. Uh, have you thought about, and in your work in, in, in Lebanon and on gender-based violence, how, how you tackle that and how you empower other women to support the uh, women, peace and security agenda? Uh, thank you uh, so much. And as probably as I'll reference the, these conversations in the future and say I was lucky enough to hear from our amazing panelists. Uh, a few years ago, I believe in an event for 1325, I was lucky enough to, to hear Cynthia Enlow speak. And she talked about how, how patriarchy evolves and how patriarchy shifts. And I, I believe that the emphasis on this so-called add women and stir or including women in more militarized actions is, is, is an attempt to dilute the, what the spirit of the women, peace and security agenda was uh, initially perceived as. Uh, I think we're, we're all consumers of patriarchy. Uh, and, and I feel like this is a new, a new form of patriarchy instrumentalizing women for the greater gains of patriarchy and militarism and violence. I, I would definitely not blame any of the individuals because we're, we're all part and parcel of those systems. I think the future conversations perhaps focus more on accountability um, and, and where is the accountability when, when countries or, or individuals or actors do not necessarily, uh, as you said earlier, uh, uh, walk the talk. Um, and, and how is that not unilateral? We, we cannot also forget intersectional approaches and colonial histories that exist. So do we only talk about disarmament when it's politically against one faction versus the other? Or do we talk about militarization, defense budgets, and, uh, uh, and the such with, with major world powers or people who are leaders? There are so many countries who have already taken huge steps and it would be wrong to, to to devalue what, what they've done already, but there also uh, are issues where they still sell weapons and tanks to other areas of the world and there is still profitability on that. So it's a very long road, it's a very complicated road and it's convoluted with, with uh, different systems of capitalism and profitability. But I think as feminist voices have called out even on individual levels of GBV, accountability to, to the spirit of the women, peace and security agenda needs to be more at the forefront and what does that look like? I think a, a useful thought to think about as we mark two decades of this on the Security Council, uh, Anthony. Lansana, you, you talked about small arms and light weapons being a, a priority for you as chair of the Arms Trade Treaty and in part because of, as you said, this is these are the weapons that impact so many of the women in, in different parts of the world, impact their families, impact their safety. Um, we have a question here from some people saying that small arms control is often seen as a very uh, technical, operationally based area and government. And, and so that when it gets into working with national structures or local structures, it's seen as really technical. And we've all been with those export control forms and details and, and seen just how technical it can be. How, how can we convince uh, not only just the national authorities, but the civil society actors working, the police, the law enforcement authorities, to go beyond seeing small arms and light weapons as a really issue for customs, for borders, for export controls, but to really look at the reduction of armed violence as a broader issue. And, and, and is, there, is there scope for that? And given you, you've worked uh, very much on small arms and light weapons as a commissioner in your own country on that, where do you see that? Well, I, I, I sort of disagree that it is just a mere technical issue. Um, I mean, I, I have been, and do, I've done arms monitoring for, for the UN for, for, for many years. And some of the emphasis, I mean, there is a lot to be achieved, 
But also, I have to say, in terms of gender, gender-related issues, uh, quite a bit have been achieved. I remember in the 90s, I mean, if you mentioned when I was a journalist in the 90s, um, you mentioned gender issues. I mean, people will not understand what you're talking about. But since these resolutions and the, the great work that my friend Panda and others at Namibia and, 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 and Ms. Robinson and, and you and everyone have done, uh, this issue is very much uh, discussed everywhere. And of course, there is a lot to be done. And I believe that there are certain concrete steps that can be taken to make sure uh, that some, some measurable progress is made beyond what has already been achieved, beyond the consciousness of, of these issues. Uh, for example, we can begin at the national level. If um, national action plans with effective gender inclusions are, are drafted and agreed and passed as national legislation, that will be very useful. Some countries have done it. Uh, as side issues, but not as a real focus. I think we, we need to push that at the national levels, and that's really where the problem at the international level. There has much that has been done. I mean, UN missions, there is no, no UN peace mission anywhere now without a strong gender component. Uh, but still, at the national level, there are serious, serious problems. Um, there should be, I think, support for the collection of gender disaggregated data related to uh, violent crime, violence and armed conflict, these kinds of things. I think that's needed uh, to, uh, to raise the consciousness and to, to, to take concrete action. I think also conducting specific situation, specific case studies that document how these issues play out in real life situations will help a lot. Uh, these are just some of the issues. And uh, during this presidency, we will be pushing that very hard. Uh, working with some of our partners and as well as uh, certainly the civil society people. I think th these are some of the concrete steps to take to, to achieve other measurable progress. But some progress has been made across the board. As I said, I said, when I started as a journalist and you go to these war zones and, and some of these peace mission, peace operations, nobody really talks about gender issues. I mean, nobody did. Um, it was only after these resolutions have been passed that, that strong gender components we are introducing some of these things but still at the national level more at the national levels in many parts of the world in my region for example not much has been done and a lot needs to be done uh, to make sure that these actions reflect in fact what you see happening in many places in africa is a regression from some of the progress that have been made to advance gender equity uh, representation in parliament, representation in government. Um, at one point, uh, we, we, we achieved up to close to 40% in parliament or 35%. Uh, in subsequent parliaments, you have a reduction down to 15%, 20% of gender representation. Uh, so we, we, we must never tire of talking about these issues and, and pushing for, for more concrete action. I, the 50-50, Thing is extremely important. Uh, there's one thing that Anthony said, which uh, about about men supporting women in some of these issues. That's very important. But it, it is so many cases women really do not need the go ahead of men to take action. I mean, in Sierra Leone, women led and, and men followed uh, in, in war situations. So they, they, they had no option because. They represent, represented a strong moral voice and they had the numbers and they set the agenda. And I think uh, once that is done, it, it, much progress can be made. Uh, thanks, Lansana, and thanks for reminding us that perhaps where we are at this moment in time is about getting down to details, to technical, to data, to, to going further down and burrowing. And, and in that respect, uh, we have a great question from our, our board member and colleague and friend, Margaret Wallström from, from Sweden. Uh, and of course, Margaret, you could probably answer this question yourself more than anyone, better than anybody of us here. But, but she asks, what about the 1325 National Action Plans? These are the Women, Peace and Security National Action Plans that countries are developing and implementing themselves. 
could they be expanded to cover uh, more disarmament matters? Um, I don't know if anyone would like to, to, to take a, a run at that question. Uh, and Mary, do you want to take a, a go first at that? Not for the first time. I very much agree with Margaret because <laughs> she has a particular uh, knowledge of the impact of small arms um, around the world in her previous mandate for the UN. But uh, I, I agree. I, I can't understand why we haven't made this connection. I mean, as, as we've been saying on this panel, it's small arms and light weapons that devastate the lives that are part of, a, you know, weapons of rape. That, you know, it, it, it's totally incomprehensible that we haven't made that connection more. And I think, you know, I, I think it's good that we see, you know, more of the plans of action, including that. I mean, I, I did have figures about the fact that relatively few of them um, incorporating gender perspectives into arms control and disarmament um, is, is, is still, you know, not, um, uh, not a mainstream priority. And um, many of the, I, I, I can't remember how many of the, plans of action under 1325 include uh, issues of disarmament and um, bringing the gender perspective into those issues, but it's, it's quite few. No, I think so. And I think to that extent, I, 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 Ireland is to be congratulated, I think, uh, in your own country for both not just trying to look at it in terms of your development agenda, but look at it in terms of your, uh, your, your domestic agenda, as well as your disarmament policies. Uh, also, yeah, I, I, actually, if I could say, I, I, I had a, um, about nine or maybe 10 years of chairing a really interesting internal body in Ireland on women, peace and security that included the development and um, uh, humanitarian agencies who worked um, in developing countries, the foreign affairs, the police and the defence forces. It's still going on, but I'm, I'm no longer chairing and um, really digging deep into these issues. And I think you know, we need an internal dig deep if we're going to talk about these issues knowledgeably. And I am a little bit proud of that initiative in Ireland because it did work. It made, it made people more sensitive. It made the arms forces and the police more sensitive to these issues. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of, it's connecting the dots which we're trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. And we'll turn to that, I think, to get your experience too, Anthony, from that. But I will stop this little Irish fest. Um, and uh, <laughs> Osa, oh, I'll lose my job. And Osa, uh, you want to come in on this question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and sorry for barging in like this. I was going to save my comments for later, but uh, I, I thought we could have a little Swedish, perhaps, interaction. Margot and I was in cabinet at the same time. <laughs> but now, now I represent you and women. And um, uh, Margot, I think this is an excellent question. First of all, I wanted to say that when it comes to the national action plans, obviously they respond to the 1325 resolution and the following resolutions often. Uh, they are great and we know they have an impact, but only one fourth of them, 25%, are actually funded when they are adopted. And I think that in, in general makes it uh, hampers whether they actually have an impact or not. But I also wanted to say that in, um, we, we will actually tomorrow celebrate the 1325 um, resolution in the open debate in the Security Council. But already on 1st of October, we also had the stock taking of the Beijing Platform for Action 25 years later. And as you know, women, peace and security is one of the areas in that platform. And in, in, in the agreements there, there is uh, one part of that is to reverse the uh, global military spending, which is part of the Beijing platform. And that also will now be reiter reiterated in the Secretary General's report um, presented, which he will present tomorrow together with the uh, Executive Director of UN Women. And I have been thinking that there, <laughs> these discussions should have a place. And, and I think there is room to do that to a much larger and, and perhaps more elaborate, in a more el elaborated way than we have uh, done before. And of course, member states can do that uh, whenever they like, and it should probably also uh, possibly be part of the national action plans, although it comes from the uh, um, Beijing platform. That's just some thinking from, from my side. Thank you. No, thank you so much, uh, Osa, for really bringing out uh, the important thing, not only of 
what is addressed in a national action plan and whether small arms are addressed in it, whether nuclear and weapons of mass destruction are, are issued, whether chemical, biological and, and other uh, 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 weapons, but also how you make them see the light of day and how there is, is funding and how there is, as Mary said, practical follow up and continued through. Anthony, I'm going to switch to something because I, a question caught my eye in the panel that I thought was so uh, important because it speaks to the understanding and the lived experience of so many women around the world, which is that in many parts of the world, the women, peace and security agendas had great resonance. And Lanzana, you talked about it in West Africa because it relates to situations of armed conflict. But many women living in uh, different parts of the world, uh, the global north or the global south, experience small arms violence and experience violence in situations that aren't conflict. And so their lives feel like a war zone, but aren't a war zone. If we look, for example, at the number of people killed by firearms in places like Guatemala or Honduras, it's in some cases as high, if not higher than during this, the years of civil conflict itself. Um, how can uh, efforts to engage women in situations short of uh, armed conflict scenarios, how can we bring in women and the question of weapons into these scenarios? I, I am so sorry. I have to apologize. The internet here is not great and it's quite unstable. So I, I missed the question. I, I apologize so much. Could you don't worry. I'm, I'm really asking you, what's the relevance of looking at weapons and regulation of weapons and women's voices there in, in, in situations that aren't situations of war? So where most people experience situations of crime, high crime, firearm violence, but not in situations of war. Does, does the WPS have applicability in these scenarios? I, I, I would definitely, I mean, I would say definitely. Uh, uh, I've, I've several times looked at, um, so I, I actually grew up in, in the West because my parents fled the, the civil war in Lebanon around 30 years ago. And I moved back to Lebanon 20, 20 years ago uh, for, for uh, continuing my education and, and working in the field. Um, and I sometimes am astounded by the, the militarized masculinities that we can see in a conflict zone and the the masculinity that we see in in many areas in the west uh when we talk about gang mentalities when we talk about natural connotations of what it means to be a man what it means to to be a woman and how often arms and power and violence and guns are assimilated into that and again if we look at militarized masculinities as uh, ironically enough, a patriarchal masculinity on steroids, that th those fundamental bases ha have, have to be there as well. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's fine to get political, but all, all of this talk about disarmament or the reactions against disarmament in the West, um, and specifically perhaps in, in countries such as the United States, where they see it as, as an alienating their fundamental rights uh, to carry arms and to protect themselves, goes back to something uh, Mary has said, and, and Izumi has said, and we're still, and, and that you, you yourself, Renata, said that we still very much are, are not deviating from this idea of my security is the power that I have in my hands to act violently towards another person. And if I'm that strong, and if I have that ability and that potential, the propensity for violence, then other people will be too afraid to try anything uh, uh, in order to, to, to question that that um, authority. And th those authorities are with men, and that's still very much of the masculine socialization process. And it very much plays out itself in every single way against uh, the primary population that men have dominance over, and that's women. So it's the lived realities of women living under arms control in areas that are not conflict oriented, and how that has contributed to GBV in their everyday lives. Thanks, Anthony. I'm going to sort of give a, a few moments just to our panelists to sort of wrap up and think about some final comments or thoughts that they've been hearing. And, and But I did just want to, to reflect something that one of our uh, colleagues, Alison Pitlack from Wilf, Women in International League of Peace of Freedom, uh, put into the chat, which is that these national action plans that Margaret asked about and that also spoke on 
only 31% of them include references to disarmament and include specific actions to, to disarm society. So that's of uh, December of last year. So I think that's a really good practical thought for us to think about there's an agenda, there's a scope that we could want to think about in terms of practical uh, ways forward. Um, but as we as we think about in terms of where we are now in 20, 2020, two years of two decades of WPS and, and a new energy and agenda on the arms control and disarmament, uh, I think multilateral space for inclusion. I, Izumi, if, if there was one uh, priority you'd like to put on the agenda for 2021 about connecting the dots between these two agendas, what would it be? And I'm going to ask you all the same. So I put I put a Zumi in the in the spot if she's my former boss. But I'll come back to all the rest of you. Izumi. Okay, thank you. I, I missed part of a, a conversation now because my computer just got uh, a shut down, so I had to reconnect. But um, but you're asking uh, our priority agenda for the next year. Um, well, I think it's the it's. If, if I could borrow um, your expression, connecting the dots. Um, uh, for us, I think uh, there have been, you know, actually quite good work being done in individual work streams. Um, and I think what will make a, a big impact going forward now is to, to really uh, connect the dots. Um, so all of those uh, things will continue, like pursuing the parity issues, representation, um, mainstreaming, um, you know, both substantively and also uh, participation wise. Uh, but uh, my priority will be indeed um, to, to connect the dots between those actions. Thanks, Izumi. And as you also pointed out yourself, that's a dot connecting that includes not just the SDG agenda, the Sustainable Development Goal agenda, but also we heard from Panda in, from Namibia, the human rights agenda and the opportunities there. Lansana, your priorities for 2021 as to what effective action should we focus on or, or concentrate on? Well, uh, the, the key priority, of course, um, is focus on uh, the impact of small arms on light weapons, especially on, on women and children in every situation, not just in war situations, uh, is to raise awareness and to try and take action at national levels um, on, on these issues. Um, I particularly like um, the, the connecting the dot thing. I mean, there are, there are a lot being done, but they are done in silos and we need to, uh, to integrate gender into every one of these issues, human rights, SDGs, uh, arms control, disarmament. Um, there are various aspects of it you can find in all of them, but, but it needs to be highlighted as a matter of, of course, in every one of these situations it has to be talked about. And it needs to be talked about and acted upon in every, uh, at every opportunity. Otherwise, um, uh, people, people may tend to think, uh, the work has been done. The work has not been done. Much has been achieved, but there is a lot to be done. And we need to focus on that and always raise it, which is why uh, we made sure we highlighted that in, in, in the um, ATT resolution. We'll highlight it in, in the working document that we are preparing with our thematic, on our thematic focus, which will be released early next year. And we'll make sure we, we, we hold uh, important meetings around that particular theme with that particular uh, priority area, gender inclusion, gender uh, mainstreaming and everything in our work. That needs to be done and we'll do it. Thanks, Lansana. So keeping the focus, keeping the intention and not thinking that the job is done just because we've got a, a reference or in a group for an engagement. Anthony, your priority in 2021 and the one thing that you think could be a step forward. Uh, yeah, uh, so I think that the, the one of the important elements of the Women, Peace and Security agenda was increasing the, the, the impact of the voices of people who are most impacted by war and conflict uh, in terms of women and girls. So I would like to see an increase in that trajectory towards any marginalized people and for perhaps us to look at how do we more systematically include the voices of the most marginalized people globally and nationally within this, this uh, conversation and where accountability to those people fit in. 
Thanks, and I think that's also a great uh, perspective to bring for arms control and disarmament, which traditionally hasn't always included those that are affected into the conversations about the governance of the weapons that are used in, in situations that they're uh, the target of or, or the, the casualties thereof. Mary, um, your perspective, your wish list for 2021 on connecting the dots. Well, I'm allowed a wish list, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Not just one. <laughs> well, I have at least two. <laughs> and the, the first is, I, I honestly think that the, the development, the transfer and the use of weapons that enable and drive the conflicts and violence which disproportionately impact on women and girls has to be controlled. I'm firmly of the view that if we want to reduce the impact of armed violence on women and girls and achieve the goals, of Council Resolution 1325, then the regulation of weapons must be a core part of the WPS um, agenda into the future. Of course, we have a very bad example in the largest democracy. You know, um, it's awful that people seem to be rearming in the context of this election that's taking place. We need more guns to protect ourselves. You know, it's so counterindicative, and we need to get in there too and start that conversation. And a lot of it has to do with what Anthony is saying about masculinity as well. It's kind of linked to it. And then the second point, which is also a point that Anthony made, the voices of those who are victims. We hear more empathy for, and rightly so, um, the women in the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Their voice is coming out more. What about the women in the disarmament? Just the, as you said, the non-conflict situations where uh, women are subject to the small arms and the violence of guns. And the, the, um, we need to somehow gather those voices, make them more central, um, make them part of how we go forward. And obviously, I think we all feel in this panel, um, not one of us has dissented from the need to more connect the dots. Um, it is ridiculous that we're in kind of mental silos, that somehow women, peace and security is a soft issue with a lot of women involved, where your voice is heard, um, disarmament is a hard issue, it's men, it's a, no, um, we, we've got to really address that and, and bridge that. And, uh, yeah, I, I could go on since you gave me a whole opportunity, but no, that's, a, that's enough. <laughs> Santa Claus is fairly limited this year, uh, so that's your wish list, Mary. Um, no, I wanted to, to, to really, before we turn over to also in closing words, just say how much I appreciated the range of issues that the panel brought in today, and indeed the comments from the floor. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes I almost can get terrified with how much we need to incorporate. You've talked about human rights, we talked about climate, we talked about development, we talked about peace and security. At times that integration challenge can be huge and almost feel daunting. But I think what we have in the WPS and the arms control conversation at the moment is the launch of a mutually respectful in discussion a probing a question and I think a recognition that it can start with but it can't end or stop with participation and it needs to start looking at impact at roles at the role of women in all phases of regulating weapons and then thinking about women both as agents but as impact uh, as actors that also need protection and their rights respected so I think it's the start not the end of a conversation and one that we can't think of a better way uh, the disarmament community here in Geneva and around the world to have with UN women to celebrate uh, 1325 because it's also an agenda of saying how much further do we have to go and what remains to be done. So I, I'm going to turn over the floor to you also from UN women by saying that we hope you've got your homework ready and that there's going to be another two decades of women, peace and security that sees the debate really going ahead on weapons. So with, with thank you to, to everybody, um, I'm going to ask Osa to cl close us out and offer us some thoughts. And then to say to those of you, if you're interested in connecting the dots, please check on the Unidir website. It's a great report. There's lots of uh, resources and tools there and join the conversation and help us connect the dots. Osa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. This has been such an interesting discussion as uh, many of you said. I 
have really listened and learned and uh, I, hopefully I have also managed to connect some dots and to, to take that with me. I think it is an extremely uh, timely discussion, as I said, at UN Women, we are the midst of these commemorations of these important uh, resolutions and the, uh, the Beijing platform uh, earlier this month, uh, which is really the fruit of uh, work that uh, women have done in order to change future for other women and, and girls, but also for men, as we heard before. So I want to start by thanking uh, you, Renata, and Unidir for, for uh, the partnership with us and also for taking us through uh, this discussion today. And of course, the excellent uh, panel, uh, Mary, Isumi, Lansana, and uh, Anthony. It's been really, um, really interesting to, to listening to all of you. And uh, I won't try to do the whole discussion justice but some things that stuck with me perhaps and which I will definitely take with me tomorrow uh, and uh, in the open debate uh, when I listen to that uh, and when the uh, Secretary General's report is also presented about the 20 years with the resolution and uh, his recommendations uh, for the future for member states and also for the UN system uh, and um, I, the issue about power that, that many of you raised, uh, obviously I've been, I was in Beijing 25 years ago at the conference and I have been going back to the document several times obviously and also recently. And the whole idea with that document is to, to shift power from men to women for them to share power. Uh, so I think that Anthony's point about power is, is extremely relevant and the, the Beijing platform was just not a ran, random set of important things for gender equality. It was really an agenda to, to make that power shift happen. And Women, Peace and Security was one, as you know, of those uh, important uh, sections in, in that document. That power shift hasn't happened, also not within uh, Women, Peace and Security. We have had some gains but we're not there, uh, we haven't implemented the agenda. Um, as you know, uh, in 1325, uh, in, in the year 2000, that very important resolution uh, consists of four pillars, uh, as I think you mentioned, participation, protection, prevention, and relief. And as many of you pointed out, uh, the disarmament efforts to achieve the goals within those pillars are just extremely uh, crucial. And I think that at least I've learned that we have to describe those better to, to ourselves and to the world and, and set goals in relation to that, how that can be done. Uh, however, there have been steps taken in relation to this connecting the dots between the disarmament and the WPS, uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. In terms of protection and prevention, as uh, many of you alluded, to, um, in the arms uh, trade treaty, uh, it was made illegal to transfer weapons and materials if there is a risk that those will be used to commit or facilitate acts of gender-based violence. You mentioned that many of you, but that is very important. And also when it comes to relief and recovery, there have been comprehensive efforts to integrate gender perspectives in the security sector reforms and DDR policies, guidelines and programming. Um, and also, as we heard in terms of participation uh, in the uh, SG Secretary General's 2018 uh, agenda for disarmament, there are uh, commitments to achieve gender parity. And I think that those of us uh, who have the privilege to work on a daily basis uh, or almost with the Secretary General, we know that this is something that he is really adamant about. And there have also been um, steps taken, but there is still a lot to do, not least in peacekeeping uh, when it comes to women's participation. Uh, and there is also, also a lot going on. Um, so we have to do uh, much more. And we, I think we probably have to, um, uh, think um, on another level, at least I do, <laughs> after this discussion. Um, and I think that during these last six or seven months, the COVID crisis has shown us uh, different things. I personally uh, prioritize to be in contact both with my staff in conflict countries, but also with women's organizations and representatives of those in conflict countries because their situation was already very difficult, but it has become 
uh, dire during COVID, uh, many times because the conflicts have been have um, escalated, uh, escalating, but also because daily life has been so difficult and the cause of poverty, uh, etc. Uh, and in spite of this, women have been uh, working in healthcare sectors, uh, uh, in uh, pharmacies, in many, many uh, different ways to save the lives of others during this crisis. Uh, but at the same time, they have also continued working in women's groups uh, and in extremely difficult situations like in Iraq, Libya, Palestine, Syria, Yemen, and what have you. And obviously, I think for, for their work to, to be easier, disarmament is such a crucial issue. And therefore, women's organizations are often the biggest champions for disarmament. And that is uh, something that we have often discussed during those conversations and in the dialogue in order for us, you and women, to know how we can support them further and what we should be in dialogue with, uh, with, with decision makers. Um, and uh, so that also, I think, it connects with the very important issue of women's participation in general uh, in peace discussions, peace talks, uh, uh, Etc. Uh, as I said, tomorrow in the uh, in the report that the Secretary General will uh, present, he will also uh, remind about the um, agreement from uh, 1995 in the Beijing um, Platform for Action, where uh, there is the call to reduce uh, military spending and instead encourage greater investment in social infrastructure and service for human uh, services which uh, serve human security. Uh, and, and I think that need has become even uh, um, has become even clearer to us during the COVID area. Uh, and also another point uh, in general we think is to nationalize the arms trade uh, treaty and related treaties. And we think that member states should ensure complementarity of their respective peace and security frameworks works with the ATT, including national action plans of 1325, as we were talking about, and SDG uh, reporting as well. Um, we also see from UN Women's side that there is much more support for the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And I think also increasingly for the issues we talked about today or, and the, the connection of those. But we also know that gender equality in general and also the 1325 agenda is enormously underfunded. It's also not implemented in a way that, that creates uh, sustainable systems. There is too much of ad hoc and too small and not timed uh, um, interventions when it comes to reality uh, and um, to, to change reality. So I think that we have a lot of all of this to work with together and I feel very inspired by this conversation and I really look forward to discussing all of this with you. We have launched something this week called Compact for Women and Peace and Security to create a platform for these kinds of discussions on how to put even more pressure on impl implementation with member states, uh, organ women's organizations, private sector, etc. And I hope we can work together on that and in other forums. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Osa. And uh, you reminded us that we do have the WPS began as a Security Council resolution. It is a Security Council issue. And I just want to remind everybody that small arms, light weapons is a Security Council issue, that conflict is a on many conflict agendas are on the Security Council. So I think there's lots of opportunities also in the Security Council to connect the dots going forward. And I look forward to, to um, hearing and following that. And we wish you every good luck, Osa, in presenting that tomorrow and uh, in celebrating. What uh, the achievements to date. Um, colleagues, it's late here in Geneva uh, and it's even later for Anthony uh, in other places in, in Lebanon. So let me just say thank you so much to all of you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Please continue the conversation with us. And we're really uh, inspired and delighted to have such a range of good perspectives indeed. So thank you once again and good night. Be well, be safe. Take care. Thank you.